Alex Baptista has an enormous collection of whiskey. Five to 600 bottles is a lot, but the bottle count doesn't do the collection justice considering his average bottle is much more valuable than the bottles that you find on the shelves when you walk the aisles of your local liquor store. When asked what the value of his collection was, he didn't know, but he suspects it's north of 200,000. He collects entire series of bottles. He has multiples of every bottle from the Van Winkle line. He's collected almost every port finished American whiskey. He has the entire line of Boss Hog, except for the first release. He has almost every Blanton's. He has almost every Basil Hayden. He has almost every Angel's Envy Limited Edition. He has almost every Woodenville. But beyond his amazing collection, he's an amazing guy. He has become a pillar in the enthusiast community in North Texas. He is passionate about helping people enjoy the hobby of collecting whiskey. So much so that he's created a whiskey sample advent calendar just so that people can try new things and see what they enjoy. And despite the enormous amount of work in filling 1,875 sample bottles, he did it all at his cost. He's become an indispensable member of the admin team for the Facebook whiskey group, Someone Say Whiskey. He's smart, generous, successful, caring, and I'm proud to call him my friend. So grab a dram, sit back and enjoy learning about his collection and his passion for the hobby of whiskey. Hey there, Bourbon Real Talk family. Randy Sullivan here with a very special guest. We've got Alex Baptista, the extraordinaire from Someone Say Whiskey. You help me uh, help help me with some other people run an amazing whiskey club, right? Something definitely to be proud of. Yeah, something to be proud of. So I thought it would be fun because you have a pretty sick collection to come over, show people some of your bottles, talk a little bit about your passion. And so tell the people, how long have you been collecting? I mean, I think everybody started collecting when they were in college in some way or another, <laughs> but I, I would say probably, you know, to the point of passionate and seeking out specific expressions, maybe four or five years. Four or five years. Yeah, relatively new. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I, I guess I started in about 2014. Um, so yeah, I'm right in there with you. And how many bottles do you think you have? I, that is a very tough question. Um, I would say in the neighborhood of five or six hundred. Five or six hundred? Conservatively. Conservatively. And how many of those would you say are bourbon, American spirits, and how many are foreign? I would say American is 50 50. 50 /50. A, lo a lot of other products. And actually, you know, some great rums, some great tequilas and mezcals. Um, so across the spirits, I would say bourbon maybe represents 25% overall. Gotcha, gotcha. So uh, typically on Bourbon Real Talk, we drink a little something while we're talking. So what, what do you think we ought to try that's within reach? That is within reach. Oh, you know what? This one's a pretty fun one. Oh, yes. So this is a 2001 Blanton's Gold that was from the original bottling of gold. So this is the first year. Very special friend helped me get this. Oh. Hold on, there let me pour. I want to pour light. I want to pour light. This one's special. There we go. And so right. for those of you who are unfamiliar, most people in the whiskey world are familiar with Blanton's. It's, you know, comes in this beautiful Fabergé egg-looking bottle. Uh, very nice. Um, typically in the United States, it's a single barrel, 93 proof. They are just now starting to release some of the foreign expressions, but for years and years and years, this expression of gold was not available in the United States, and it was first released in Japan, and this was the first release in Japan? This was, yeah, well, gold, this was the first European release, no one. So, European release. Yeah, so, okay. um, yeah, and I happened to come across it. They, it was post the era, so there was an era where they weren't doing letters yeah, on, yeah, yeah. on the feet, but uh, this was after they had, they had started doing letters but you can even tell just the difference between some of the other golds toppers yeah you just see the age on, yeah on yeah the pewter definitely worn down a little bit and so what would be your most prized possession in terms of your bottles man there's you know i think i'm i'm like you i follow a lot of some of the the, the ways you like to experience whiskey and so i always try and tie flavors to memories to those kind of feelings and those experiences so one that always brings just a flood of memories back for whatever reason is probably the Van Winkle Rye 13 year. Yeah. Uh, this is the 18, but 2018. But I think that one's just really 
has a special place in my heart. Okay, what was the experience that you had with it that you know, makes I, it stick? Did you drink it with someone those, special? Did you? I, I think I've, I've gotten a chance to experience it with quite a few dif- of different really special people. Actually with you and Rodney and uh, the group of Someone Say Whiskey we went to pick in January was the first time that I had had it. Oh, okay. And so that the whole experience around it, trying it at the bar, learning that in some states you can actually buy bottles from the bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope the TABC can figure out how to let us do that. <laughs> um, it was all about the, the experience. And then ever since I've had that, it's always been when somebody who appreciates the spirit comes over and you get to experience it with them again. So it kind of just starts to build. And now it's at a level of lore that I don't know. I can't even explain. Right, right. See, that's interesting because I guess if you do have a special bottle, you bring it out on special occasions and yeah. each occasion creates a memory. Right. So the other day somebody was saying on the club, they were like, well, you know, I killed this bottle and, or I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to drink this bottle and I don't want to put the club sticker on it because I feel bad throwing the sticker away. And if I keep the sticker separate, then I feel like I'll be able to put it on something and right. keep it for longer than I would the bottle. And I just have this mental philosophy that I replace the liquid in the bottle with the memories it created, right? So Absolutely. to me, when I see a bottle that's half full of, of whiskey, it's also half full of memories, yeah. right? And so I, that makes me not feel bad when I kill a Pappy 20 Absolutely. or I kill a BTAC or something that is probably going to be difficult, if not impossible, to replace. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do see that you have uh, more than just the Pappy Van Winkle Family Reserve Rye up there. Uh, what, what all do you have from the Van Winkle line? So I've got three of the old rips, two lot Bs, two of the 13s. Uh, 15 and a 20, and we just killed the 23, so it actually was convenient that I could fit them all in. Uh, so, yeah, and I ended up kind of acquiring them over time um, yeah. through various different channels. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it looks like you like to, to chase the, the Van Winkles there. It's, but it's, it's not even so much that. I mean, obviously, it's everybody who collects has a little bit of a pride in the wow factor when somebody comes in and goes, oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. The people who aren't even into bourbon know about it. So it's, it's a kind of a, a nice thing to have to, and then introduce to all these other great expressions instead of some of those. Um, but I, I think that for me, you know, it's about the kind of neurotics of collecting full verticals and, sure. and not, having, uh, not having the one missing from it. Because, and that's why I won't start with Booker's. Right. Because I'll never be You'll able never to catch, catch up. up. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah, I got caught up in, in collecting series when I first started collecting. Mm-hmm. And I was doing pretty good with the, um, with the Orphan Barrel series. Yeah. And I missed one. I missed Old Blowhard. And I collected a couple after that and I kept looking for old blowhard and it had gotten so expensive on the secondary and now I probably would have just bought it but I was early into my tater years right and I didn't want to spend the money and so I make it a point to never get even close to starting a series because I'm so neurotic yeah. that, I, that I'll spend any amount you've, of money. You've reached a level of self-actualization. <laughs> I'm not quite there yet, but I'm yeah. sure I need to get there. But you do collect series. So what, what do you have uh, massive percentages of series in? Um, I would say, you know, the 1792 is a, a crowd pleaser. I, I've loved a lot of those expressions. Blanton's obviously Weller lineup. Basil Hayden. So that's one that you're not going to probably see at a lot of you know, big w- bourbon drinkers' houses, but it's, I mean, once you start the series, you gotta finish it. Mm-hmm. So there are some expressions in there I'm not excited about, but I love bringing out the dark rye and the Caribbean rum rye mm-hmm. because it's always something that somebody will show up and say, I'm not, I'm not a bourbon drinker, I don't like whiskey. And I go, well, hey, try this. Mm-hmm. It's a way to bring people into it that's a little bit more comforting instead of slapping them with a cast strength Blanton's, or right. okay, sorry, cast strength, you know, Stag Jr. Right. So it's, it's a way that I can try and be more inclusive to everybody who's here. And I haven't found anybody who has said that the Caribbean Reserve rye or the dark rye is not phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. It's a very approachable, and I think it's lower, isn't it 86 80, proof? 80. 80 proof? Okay. Yeah, it's lower proof, so it's more approachable for people who aren't used to drinking those types of spirits. Yeah. Um, you also happen to be the proud owner of a OFC. Yes, the 2000, oh, sorry, uh, 94. You're, right. you're, you're free to move about the, the country. I, I, and I love how where it was placed yeah. really comforted. I'll, uh, I'll throw up all. a photo of where it was, but it, it's, 
it was sitting on the edge of the uh, overlook so that it could have fallen from the second floor down. Um, but let's get a look at this bad boy. So it comes in a box, right? Yep. Yeah, the box here. is over here. And then it, it's inside of a sleeve. So it comes in this box, and then it's inside of a sleeve, and then it's in this beautiful... It's a mahogany case. Everything that they have is actual copper, so uh -huh. not copper coloring. And then... Hey, let's put it up here. I think, I think they'll be able to see it. There we go. So, yeah, and then they have a, a, a roller barrel where it's a crystal glass and hand-painted bottle. I think they did just over 1,000 uh, each of the releases. Okay. And honestly, I was just very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time yeah. with the right people uh, and was able to, to pick this up. So let's talk about that. One of the great things about the uh, collecting hobby is you do get to meet a lot of great people. Um, what have been some of the experiences that stick out in your mind because you've been involved in this hobby? Well, I think about, you know, a couple. The first time I really met someone through the community, through an enthusiast community, because I've only been on, I would say, you know, the kind of Facebook enthusiast community for the past 18 months. Yeah. Really not that long. Um, and the first person I met off of the community, uh, a guy named Blake locally, that was one of the experiences that really stuck out to me because I came by to pick something up as we had been talking about something and he opened up his entire bar, which was incredibly uh, impressive and very humbling experience to meet someone that's just right from the first time they meet, so warm and welcoming. So that is one of the experiences that really steps out to, to me what uh, you know, the community does. Okay. And that is actually a pretty common yeah. experience in the community that can be very shocking for a new person, right? If you're just now getting into the habit or hobby of collecting whiskey and you try Blanton's at a restaurant and you're trying to figure out how to find your first yeah. bottle of Blanton's and then you buy a club pick or whatever and, you, and, and they choose to pick it up from your house and they come over and you have almost every Blanton's and a bunch of them are open and you're like, hey, do you want to try the first Blanton gold ever? And they're like, wait, there's a different expression of Blanton's besides <laughs> like the single yeah. barrel. And you're like, yeah, there's a bunch of them. And you know? then they're at the bottom of the rabbit hole. Right, right. And then, and then they, there they go down the rabbit hole. But they get to have that experience of just trying a lot of different things. Right. And that can be, you know, not only a very memorable experience, but it's partly what gets people addicted to the hobby. Yeah. And it actually, I think, generates a new type of... Uh, I don't know, like a positive outlook in, in, in life where you're, you're, you all of a sudden become inspired to be more giving and, yeah. and sharing and you care less about things and more about people. It definitely has a, there's a lot of pay it forward aspect of it all, right? You see that and you go, oh, this is how it goes. And so you get kind of indoctrinated into that kind of community and that procedure. And then you're then getting the next generation down the road as, as you get your collection up. So it's something that keeps the self fulfilled because the pay it forward aspect of it's so strong. Yeah. And it's like, you can't, you cannot give enough away because as fast as you're giving, it's flowing right back to you. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And it, that's a very hard concept for me to wrap my head around when I first started getting involved in these whiskey clubs and things, but I, I totally see it now. So what are some of the other series you collect? I think you collect uh, boss hogs, don't you? I do. Yes. Uh, and I just got the seven in, uh, only one I don't have is year, the first release. Yeah. Um, and it's exorbitant and difficult to find. So I'll live within my means and enjoy two through seven. Yeah. Well, speaking of living within your means, normally when somebody has a large collection like this, everybody becomes curious about what it is that they do for a living. So what is it that you do for a living? I, uh, I am a VP of sales for a software company. For a software company? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, how long have you been there? I've been at this company for about three and a half years. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. I thought, I thought that you'd been, and I noticed you didn't say the name, so I'm guessing we're not supposed to. <laughs> um, and I They have really, really good lawyers and I don't want to take my no, chances. No, 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 no. <laughs> we, we definitely want to protect your position. Uh, but yeah, VP of sales of a large soft, software company uh, gets you 500 bottles of whiskey money. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, I, and I wouldn't even say it's it's gone over time. Like, I, it didn't just appear. Yeah, That's sure. Nice it's, it's, like, if you and wanted to walk in and buy all these bottles from one store, oh, it doesn't it, work it like would, that. It wouldn't work. Yeah, yeah, but, and my wife and I uh, don't have children. We've decided that's the path for us. So, you know, a lot of people are like, how do you do it? I was like, well, I, I don't, I don't have kids. have kids. <laughs> like, you're, you're paying for a kid's college fund, which is admirable, and I'm drinking a college fund. <laughs> so, 
I think it's it's an opportunity that I can then take that and share it with everybody else share who does every, have the kids. Yeah. And go, Here, have a have a pour of a will it tenure. Yeah, and then if they got all those kids, they probably need it. So it works they out. definitely need it more than me. So let's let's take a look at one of the boss hogs. Which uh, which one did you say you just got in? Uh the seven just came in. Yeah. So interesting thing about the seven is that you know once you get to a certain spot, you have to negotiate bottles out of the way. Oh shoot! I picked a bad one. <laughs> You're good. There we go. There we go. All right. So this is the seven. These unsnap here. Yep. There we go. And this was aged in teak wood. And I want to say it was, it was all about the Spanish oak. Spanish all about the, oak. The trade route. So this is Magellan's Atlantic. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't realize that they were doing special... Most of the boss hogs have finishes a on finish. So you've got Calvados uh, finish as one of the, I think, Spirit of Mav or, or Spirit of Mortimer. So there, a lot of the boss hogs are finished in some other special product. Last one, it was a Japanese wood. Gotcha. Um, and I've, I actually bought one of the early boss hogs mm -hmm. and drank it and enjoyed it, liked it, had some pours at a bar. This is probably in 2015. And then the price went from like 189. Yeah, that threw, jumped pretty quickly. Jumped yeah. pretty quickly up to because I think I paid 189 for my yeah. first bottle, and I still have the empty because the topper is so nice and it's a pretty bottle. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I may have given it away to a lamp maker. I can't remember, but anyways. Um, and once the price jumped up to $500 a bottle, I was like, all right, I'm out. Yeah, it's, it can be pretty steep. And I know that's one of the things that makes it pretty controversial is, you know, a lot of people will say, hey, if you want to have a, a Canadian whiskey, there's better at under $500. Sure. But, you know, I take some to the marketing. Obviously, they're really good marketers, uh, something you see a lot in the Scotch world. And they're really good um, pickers and finishers. So I feel like I get my money's worth every time I get it. Yeah, you've got uh, quite a lot of uh, Angels Envy special releases as well, too. Right? Yeah, so we've been we've talked before. You said, "Kind, what are the what are your what were your gateway drugs?" And it was Angels Envy and then uh, Boss Hog for Rise. Yeah. Um, so those two are always going to be near and dear to me. So did I have, you get the the uh, what's the one special one that was like super expensive for Angels Envy? Yeah, Mizanara. Yeah, do you have Mizanara? Mm -hmm. Let's see. All right. Is there any special trick to opening this? It's got a two hinge. So. Oh, two hinges. Nice. Uh, and what they did was to load their crystal topper into the top. Oh, okay. So that you get to keep the uh, keep it as a nice decanter when mm -hmm. it's all said and done. Yeah, the whole purpose, I think, when, when they designed the bottle was once it was done to be able to uh, take off the label and have a really nice etched decanter. Yeah, it's really beautiful. And if you've noticed, it's half empty. We have gotten into it. <laughs> our, our housewarming party kicked it off, and then after that, it was like, it was hey, like, it's open, yeah, so it's open, no so holds let's, barred. Yeah, let's streak it. Let's streak it. Speaking of, would you like some? Uh, yeah. All right, let's do some Mizanar. Let's do it. Do, do we got to pause? What's going on? Oh, you want a drink? So Rodney's off camera. <laughs> And he wants to drink a Mizanara. <laughs> That's how you know it's important. Like, he what? just literally stopped the middle of this podcast uh, to be like, hey, get another glass and pour just me. Just so you know, I think that he had gone into the media room and laid down and fallen asleep. <laughs> and then he heard the Mizanara bottle come out and he woke up like a puppy dog that hears like food getting poured. Food getting poured. <laughs> He's like, I gotta he get me some up. of that. Man, that was impressive. That was impressive. I've never seen Rodney move that fast. No, no, that was like super, super fast action. Uh, so, yeah, so this Mizanara, it, um, it's been a controversial bottle because of its price. Also, yeah. And there, I, what's it made out of? It's like a fourteen-year and a well, five year or something yeah like. it was i, I want to say and i'll probably get this wrong and i'm sorry angels envy maybe you have to revoke my 500 main membership uh i want to say it was basically their 10-year bourbon to commemorate their 10 years and then finished in mizunara oak casks oh okay so those and mizunara is a special type of japanese wood i think it has to be like 100 years old or something so yeah. old growth type stuff that's cool 
Um, so you collect a lot of Angel's Envy. Yep. You collect a... But, but don't get it twisted. Like, you actually collect a lot of things that are not necessarily... Like taterific bombs. Yeah, I right? mean, I I found great whiskey across the board. Yeah. Um, some of my favorites I like to kind of fool with people, and a lot of members will know this, is the Maker's Mark 101. Mm -hmm. You blind it, and I've never had anybody say it wasn't one of the Top most dogs. delicious things that they've had. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's one that I've used. I've actually just started with Jim Beam Black recently, mm -hmm. messing with people as well, uh, and I, it it's gotten some pretty good reviews. Now, you did something that was pretty awesome this year. You did a whiskey advent calendar. Yes. Do you have one as an example? I do. There's one there, it looks like. Yes. So this was probably a year in the making and with help from a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. uh, we, over the year, decided what we wanted to select and then was helped to capture a lot of these uh, expressions. And it's really about being able to try things that are on the shelf on every on every location mm -hmm. that um, that you might walk past and, and actually find out is pretty pretty delicious. Yeah, and so the concept is they get uh, how many twenty five twenty five one ounce samples, uh, obviously one a day through December up to Christmas Day across the world of whiskey, mm -hmm. American brand uh, um, bourbon, Canadian rye, uh, Isla scotches, Bayside scotches, Japanese whiskey. So I really tried to cover the whole world. Yeah. Well, that Mizanar is tasty. Um, if you, but you'd have to lie to me to tell me it wasn't, because uh, yeah, I mean, I, something I, I about see it. why there's people that were upset that it was so expensive, mm -hmm. but um, but it's it's really good whiskey. I'm not mad at it. I'd be it happier at it a different taste, price. It doesn't even taste like uh, what you expect. Like it's yeah. not Angel's Envy. It's not what you think with the port finish and everything. Right. Well, this Advent calendar is awesome. And so these were, um, they've got the Someone Say Whiskey logo on them. Mm -hmm. um, so this was something that you did inside the Someone Say Whiskey Club? I did, yeah. And I did it just at cost, just to let, give people an opportunity. Yeah, so. this wasn't a profit-making venture. It was just to give yeah. people a chance to try new things. That's really awesome. How many of those did you end up making? 75. 75 times uh, 25 samples? That's a lot of sample bottles. Yeah, it was something near 2,000 sample bottles. We ended up filling over the course of about a day. Oh my gosh, that is insane. They're the, you know, the little um, dispensers they use for mm -hmm. Catholic Mass? Uh huh. Those that's work. That's what you use, yeah. That's nice. the secret to filling a lot of sample that's bottles. That's how you do a lot of samples real fast. That's right. I did not know that. So let's talk a little bit about your um, involvement in Someone Say Whiskey. So you first get in. Did you kind of hang back for a little bit and kind of watch what was going on, or you'd dive in, you know? Feet first kind of a guy. It was, you know, it was a, it was a bit of trepidation. You know, mm -hmm. I said I, I'd been in it for about a year and a half at this point. And so, you know, about the first month, month and a half, maybe two, I was really observational. I tried to look and kind of see how are people talking to each other, how are they acting, how are they, mm -hmm. uh, you know, basically engaging with each other. Learn as much as I could. And then after that, I just dove in mm -hmm. and, you know, made some mistakes. You know, so I've definitely got some of the internet wrath at sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but... You know, I think I, I started to, to see, you know, every bourbon group has a different identity, has a different kind of culture. Mm -hmm. And I started to see one over another and, and decided, you know, this is kind of where, where, I'm, where I'm drawn towards and just dove in with both feet and wasn't scared to meet new people and, and have new experiences. So what, what was the um, cultural difference that attracted you to someone say whiskey over some of the alternatives? Well, I think you know, every there's just different cultures. They're neither right or wrong. Sure. Uh, and I, you know, you notice some that are kind of very exclusive. They're always going to have hard limits, activity requirements. You must, you know, post once a day or give back, you know, once a month. They'll always have those types of requirements. Uh, I think there's some groups that are kind of form clicks, like you know, groups of people. Um, and when you know there's free communication, that that can get sometimes contentious. Um, and then you just see kind of the, the general enthusiast community that are about you know, building up new people, not kind of giving them a hard time if they ask a, a basic question and you know, helping other people to come along because they know that they were there once too. And, right. and so that, that was where I was kind of drawn towards. To Someone Say Whiskey, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have to tell you that I've been involved with Someone Say Whiskey from its inception and it has been a struggle 
to create that culture because there are so many people. It, there's almost nobody involved in the whiskey community that's not involved in multiple groups. Right. And you almost get used to, oh, this is just how it's done. Yeah. When, a, when a new person comes in and asks how you find Blanton's, you roast them. You right. know, you, you, if someone comes in and they say that they like, uh, you know, will it pot still? You, you, you tell them that they deserve to die of face yeah, cancer if they like you. that whiskey. You know, you, you lose your mind on those people. Yeah. And then we, we are inviting people and they're used to acting that way and they come into the club and they start to act like that way and we're like, ah, we deleted your post because we don't like, yeah. you know, trying to create this different culture. Well, and I think that's where the transparency is important. Like, I've, I know I've been removed from groups and I didn't even know what I did wrong. I was never told beforehand or afterwards and when I've reached out to admin say, hey, what happened here? Um, I got nothing back. Sure. Uh, and so, you know, I think when we try to have transparency, you know, if we remove a post, we're going to follow up and just say, hey, you know, it's not like I wanted to. This wasn't my grand scheme to exert my power. Right. This is why we did it. Hope you understand. Sure. And most people are, are really, you know, forgiving in that way. Yeah. Um, and the ones that aren't, aren't a good fit. Right. <laughs> it's, that, it's that simple. Yeah. So I think the transparency about talking through that and, you know, what it, what a top contributor means and, and, everything around just being complete barrel drop procedures that, you know, spent hours and hours and hours putting together. Um, and I think that kind of transparency helps people, yeah. people know. So what would you say is your favorite? Uh, well, actually, before we talk about that, you actually have become a collector of finished whiskeys. Yes. Um, let's talk about that. What is it that you collect? How many do you have? Yeah. How many I, are you missing? That's, uh, that was another rabbit hole that I didn't mean to go down. But as I started to realize, I said Angel, Angel's Envy was kind of a gateway for me, that I really like the complexity that comes out of a port finish, mm -hmm. plus the intensity of, of a bourbon or, or an American whiskey. Um, I started to realize that, hey, this kind of port finish thing is interesting to me. And then I wanted to make it a game. So at that point... I said, I, I'm going to do something that I don't know anybody else that has done, which is trying to collect every American whiskey or bourbon that has been finished in specifically port barrels mm -hmm. and bring them all together and have a massive blind head-to-head -head tournament March Madness style. That's amazing. And how many do you have you acquired so far? Uh, I've got two that are in transit, and that'll put me at 37. Okay. How many do you know of that you don't have? Three. Okay. What was the hardest to get of the 37 you have? Wiggle. Wiggle port finish. Okay. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> it's from Pennsylvania. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, have you tried most of these? Or did you only get one bottle and you're waiting until you get I, them all? Some of them I only got one bottle because they were so hard to find. Yeah. Um, so I only ended up... Uh, my plan is to kind of wait to open them up because I want to try and make it as scientific as possible. I'm going to completely blind them. I'm going to first gather them in similar groups. There's a bunch from Texas. There's a bunch from the Northeast, those types of things. Um, and then kind of use those to split them into their, to their regions, have uh, my wife completely number them sporadically, and then start the head-to-heads matched up. For, for her, it'll be the only one that has the key. So I can blind them. I'm going to fill the sample bottles all in the same day. So they've all been open for the same amount of time. Nobody can claim, you know, whether you believe right. it or not, the oxidation. Um, it'll all be uh, that way. And I'm going to send it out to a group of individuals, uh, collect their brackets, and then we'll try and look at some algorithms. We'll punch it into the gagonculator and we'll spit out the highest scoring spirit to be crowned the king of the American whiskey or bourbon pork, pork finished. finished. That is phenomenal. I want to publish that on the podcast when it comes out. Right. I think that I think that would be worthy of another episode. That the amount of effort that's gone into that very interesting. So for those of you who don't know, in the United States, uh, most of the whiskey that gets made, if it's what they call a mash bill whiskey, so if it's bourbon, rye, um, wheat whiskey, whatever, um, there's rules about what percentage of what grains have to go in there for them to be in that category. Uh, but they all have to be aged in a new charred oak container. Mm -hmm. It says container, but it's always a barrel. And uh, that's very different because in other parts of the world, most of the other parts of the world age their whiskey in used American oak barrels because they can only be used once, once. here, but they can be used multiple times in other places. And so when you're talking about, say, Scotland, where they're making scotch, when they're making their their blend um, or marrying together of barrels, if you will, 
they have different casts that provide different nuance of flavor that they can blend together to seek after a particular profile. In the United States, they really can't do that because we're not using any used barrels. And so uh, Lincoln Henderson was kind of the, the pioneer and he was once an employee of uh, Brown Foreman. I've heard that he was credited with the creation of Gentleman's Jack uh, before he left the company. And then he started Angel's Envy with um, his son and grandson. And their products are all what they call finished bourbons. And, and the TTB, who's in charge of regulating all this stuff, had to come up with kind of a new category. So when you apply for a label approval for whiskey in the United States, you have to classify what category it is. And category 101 is straight bourbon. Category 141 is just bourbon. And there's nuanced differences between those having to do with when they're distilled and how long they're aged and things like that. Um, but they created a new category called 641, class 641, that's specialty class. And basically what the rules say is that if you complied with all of the requirements for category 101, you can still say that it's a straight bourbon on it, but you have to say finished in mm -hmm. and then what you finished it in. So if you make a whiskey and you age it for four years in a new charred oak barrel and you complied with all the rules and it's a straight bourbon, you finish it in port, now it's class 641 and those are what you're collecting. Yep. And that is phenomenal. And how do you feel? Obviously, you're a proponent of it. But how does it make you feel when you hear whiskey nerds say, that's not even real bourbon? Uh, I mean, I don't think it's very inclusive. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of innovation that was shunned back you know, prior, right? I imagine the first person who did charcoal filtering. That's not a real bourbon. We know now that there's uh, Jack Daniels that's making more whiskey than just about anybody in the world right. doing pretty well at that. And I'm sure they were shunned when they came to that. So and I think it's, it's hindering innovation, hindering new things. I, and I would say at the end of the day, why does that matter? Why right. does it matter if it's real bourbon or real bourbon plus some other things that come from a barrel? Sure. Um, so that's, I don't know, I, I think it's a little bit unfair. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I kind of lean more on your side. I think it's as long as there's disclosure, right? Sure. And, and if they follow all the rules and there's disclosure and no one's buying something thinking that it's something that it's not, I'm, I'm on board with it. And I say you let the producers, you know, innovate Free market. And, and, and figure out how they want to sell their whiskey. And as long as no one's being tricked, let's do it. That's my general philosophy. Yeah. So what would be um, your favorite like shelfer product for you to just have a pour at the end of the night, easy to find, you know? I mean, I keep coming back to that Maker's Mark 101 right now. That's your jam? And I know, it, I think it was travel exclusive. Normally, COVID obviously messed that up. So uh, they moved it back to retailers. Retail, yeah. Uh, but it's just one that always just... Really Pleases. satisfies, yeah. yeah. And for what it is. And it's a good proof. It's, you know, yeah, but not right too right much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which I guess, you know, if you can't find it, you could always proof down a cast strength to 101. Sure. It's the same same product, so. Yeah. Just throw some distilled water in there. Mm -hmm. Do you have an open? I do. Can I try it real fast? Of course. And then we can kind of kind of wrap it up. So what would be the, if, let's say that you're, you're out there, you're watching this. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm going to show them, you know, pictures of all of your collection and they're going to see all of your amazing bottles and all that stuff. Um, if you, if somebody out there is watching this at home and they've been an avid drinker, maybe they like, you know, wild turkey or whatever, Jim Beam, that's their drink, but they're starting to get whiskey curious. Um, what would be your advice to them? I'd say, you know, if you're in a community, engage with the community if you're not join one obviously um and just get out there and, and put yourself out there and, and tell people what you're looking for and you know usually in most communities you can find somebody that's willing to share some of it and and have that experience of meeting a new person and, and getting to share some pores with them so i'd say you know try it all yeah give everything a chance you know i know there's a lot of people that are you know advocates for castering for its low proof i mean i think if you like it the way you like it then it's perfect sure well and and i also think that you know if you get involved with a community and you're getting negative feedback because you're you don't like the same things that the vocal people like then 
look for another community. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty easy. There'll, there'll, there'll be one that you'll be able to find that fits exactly what you're looking for. And if you can't find one, you can always join Someone Say Whiskey. Absolutely. Um, you can find us on Facebook forward slash Someone Say Whiskey. Is the question mark on there? I can't remember. I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, but you can just search for us on Facebook. Uh, you got anything else you want to say to the people before we wrap it up? No, I just say, you know, get out there, meet some new people, enjoy the spirit, keep your mind open for experiences and opportunities to try things you might not have been able to in the past. Sounds good. And if you want more information about Bourbon Real Talk, you can find us at bourbonrealtalk.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, forward slash Bourbon Real Talk. And I'd love to hear your comments down below. If you have any show suggestions, if you have any questions for me or for Alex, throw them in. And if you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. This content is being brought to you by the Bourbon Real Talk American Whiskey Aroma Kit. This is a tool that I put together to help all you whiskey aficionados out there develop your palates. You can sit down with the vials and train your senses, or you can sit down with a great dram and break that whiskey down to its components. If you have any interest in purchasing a kit of your own, head on over to bourbonrealtalk.com forward slash shop and pick one up. Thank you for listening.